I think all of you know that I love to study the Word of God. I love to teach the Word of God. There's nothing I'd rather do than teach this Bible class. It is my number one enjoyment in ministry is getting to teach this class. I hope you enjoy hearing the teaching, not just mine, but whoever's teaching and studying the Word of God. Amen? Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. My Bible study tonight is going to be very different than what you and I are used to. I am not going to be preaching tonight, probably won't ever get preachy in this Bible study tonight. I'm going to talk to us. I'm literally going to try my best to just talk with us, to share some things with all of us that I think could be a great blessing to us in our walk with God. If there's one area that I think there are many misunderstandings about out there, it's the area of prayer. There are so many different opinions on prayer about how often we should pray, how long we should pray, what time we should pray, how we should pray, what we should say when we pray. And so my Bible study subject tonight, again, is very different. I'm teaching on the subject, my personal commitment to, my personal commitment to and understanding of prayer. My personal commitment to and understanding of prayer. Now, I want to tell you up front, this is Jack Cunningham, opinion, commitment, understanding, What I'm going to teach tonight is what I do. I'm not going to teach you something I read in a book. I'm not going to teach you some hypothetical prayer scenario that I think maybe would happen. I'm 65 years old, been in ministry since full-time ministry since 19, and I'm going to teach tonight what I do, what I did today, what I did last week, what I've done for the last several decades. This is my personal commitment to and understanding of prayer. If you understand all that, say amen. Amen. My goal this evening, so you understand, is to help you. To help you to know and understand what prayer, in my thinking, is all about. Now, why am I taking so much time setting this up? Because I'm going to tell you up front, 50% of you is not going to agree with me. Because you've bought into what's been said, what's been taught. Not that anybody ever gave you scripture for it, but you buy into all this stuff. You get one person out there that prays an hour a day for four or five days, and we let them testify, and they get up here and demand that everybody in the world ought to pray an hour a day. They, and if they ever go into the second hour, the third hour, watch out. We're all going to hear that that's what everybody's got to do. Somebody gets up at five in the morning and prays and does that for one week on Sunday, we're all going to hear about it. Now, that in itself is unscriptural. Bragging about your prayer life is actually contrary to the scripture. And so what I'm going to talk about tonight is from the Bible. How many of you want to know what the Bible says about prayer? Are you ready? I've got about 15 points to make tonight. And again, all 15 of them are things that I do. They're not things I think about, talk about, things I read somewhere. This is my prayer life. If you understand that, say amen. So 15 things. Number one, I want you to understand that I strongly believe in prayer. I don't just casually believe in prayer. I strongly believe in prayer. I believe that prayer ought to be the first thing that we do. I believe that everybody who is a child of God needs to have a prayer life. I don't know how you can have a relationship with God and never talk to Him. Or never let him talk to you, which by the way is 50% of praying. It ought to be 50% talking and 50% listening. And all the above is called prayer. We get it in our mind, we got to pray in King James English. And most of us pray with one eye open looking at our watch. Have I got my hour in yet? 
I believe we need to have the kind of relationship with God that we want to talk to Him and want Him to talk to us. I promise you it would dramatically change all of our lives if we would just talk to the Lord every day. You can do it going down the road. You can do it on your way to work. If you've got a 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minute uh, uh, drive to work, why don't you spend that talking to the Lord? And nobody in other cars need to see you beating the steering wheel, weeping and crying and screaming at the top of your lungs. That's not necessarily prayer. It's already started, hasn't it? I know a lot of folks have been taught how to pray. They've been taught, you got to come up here and beat the altar. And guess what? I've been in a place where I needed to beat the altar. I've been in a place where I was praying for some of you that I'm out here walking the floors and beseeching God to intervene. But on your day-to-day prayer life, it ought to be talking to God and letting God talk to you. I was telling Brother Rivera, we was back in the office, you know, that last uh, Friday night we had a wedding here. And I said, you know, what if when we're doing the, 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 the nuptials, when we're trading all of our commitments to one another, what if the minister said, now hold on a minute, I want to talk to you. I'm going to require of you that you talk to each other at least 60 minutes a day. I'm going to require that you do that at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I'm going to require that you do it at the top of your lungs with tears running down your face. How long do you think that marriage is going to last? And yet we are of the opinion that that's how we have to talk to God. Now again, you let one of my grandbabies, my wife, my daughter, somebody I love dearly get in a mess, I'm going to be crying and beating the altar. I'm telling you. But that's not my everyday prayer life. If you understand the difference, clap your hands. I went on and told Brother Rivera, I said, what about baby dedications? What if while I'm going through the baby dedication and I say, I don't only dedicate the baby, I dedicate parents. Now, here's what I want from each of you. Here are the guidelines for parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles. I want you to talk to that child one hour a day. I want you to do it at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I want you to scream to the top of your lungs when you're talking to it. Hello? Would anybody in this church not think your pastor flipped his rocker? Would there be anybody here that wouldn't at least think whether you say it or not? That ain't talking. That ain't communication. You can't order communication. You can't tell somebody when to communicate, how long to communicate, how loud you should be when you communicate, what language you should speak when you communicate. That's not communication. Communication has to flow freely. Hello? Hello? And that's what he wants with us. He wants to have communication with us. My goal, I told you tonight, is to make prayer simple, to make prayer easy to understand and easy to accomplish some of the things I've preached in my life and some of the things I've sat in the audience and heard other preachers preach in my life. They're just not They don't have anything to do with communication with God. First of all, the way some of us scream and holler and boo-hoo and beat the altar, we couldn't hear from God if He was screaming back. Hello? You know, I'm way too much of a realist for most of y'all, ain't I? I strongly believe in prayer. I believe that every one of us should have a relationship with God that allows us to communicate open and freely with Him and allows Him to communicate open and freely with us. There needs to be real, real talk going on between God and me, God and you. If you understand that, say amen. Point number two in my notes tonight is I believe that prayer is powerful. 
I don't believe prayer is just a habit or just an exercise. I don't believe that prayer is some kind of a religious guideline that we should all submit ourselves to. I don't believe that prayer ought to be uh, uh, something of just going through the motions and putting in our time. It's amazing how many people want to brag about, you know, I pray 30 minutes a day. You know, pastor, I pray an hour a day. You know, pastor, the other night, I prayed for two hours. Really? Was it prayer? Were you talking to God? Was God talking to you? Or was it Jesus, 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 Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Because that ain't prayer. Ooh, Jesus, I'm making folks upset. That is not prayer. Prayer is communication. There's times for worship. There's times for me to just get really, really, really serious with God. But communication is a conversation. And I believe that people that know how to have that conversation with God have found out that prayer is powerful. It's powerful when you know I'm talking to him and he's talking to me. It's powerful. Don't you let anybody underestimate the power of your prayer because you're, you're, you're not louder than the PA can get. Don't let anybody underestimate the power of your prayer because you're not beating on something with your fist. Don't let anybody underestimate the power of your prayer because you're just talking to God and then you're stopping and meditating on Him and giving Him a chance to talk back to you. That is powerful. Clap your hands and say amen whether you believe it or not. The Bible said in James chapter 5 and verse number 16, the effectual, everybody said effectual, say fervent, prayer of a righteous man, say availeth, say much. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer is powerful. I went to the dictionary to look up those words today so I could bring you a definition for each of them. First of all, the word effectual. It means effective. It produces a desired result. The effectual prayer. The effectual prayer. An effective prayer. A prayer that produces result. Fervent. That word means having or displaying passionate intensity. Number three, it says prayer of a righteous man availeth. Here's the, word, the definition of the word availeth. To be strong, to be robust, to have power, to have strength, to overcome, to be a force, and to be able. That's what availeth means. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, what's it going to do? It's going to be strong, robust, powerful, strength to overcome, be a force, and to be able. I've come to tell you tonight that prayer is powerful. And if you're not praying as a child of God, you're missing one of the most important exercises and one of the most beneficial exercises of knowing Him. Say amen, somebody. Do you understand, I think you do, but let me remind you of it, that you have a right according to the scripture. You have a right because God himself invites you to pray. Do you understand that when you pray, you're praying to the creator of the universe, the one that set the sun, moon, and stars in its place, the one that created everything you see, everything you hear, the very breath that you breathe, the air that that is breathable. He created the entire universe and that God said, if you'll just talk to me, I'll talk to you. Honey, that's powerful. That is powerful. James chapter 5 and verse 16. Same verse I read you in the King James Version. Put it up there, if you will, in the Amplified Version of the Bible. I love the Amplified Version sometimes, and it does just what it's called. It amplifies certain portions of the verses. James 5, 16, the Amplified Version said, The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man or woman makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. 
Somebody say prayer. prayer. That was number two. The third point I'm wanting to make tonight is that I practice prayer. Your pastor practices prayer. I got the Holy Ghost when I was seven years old, baptized the same night. So I've had the Holy Ghost for 58 years. I've been in full-time ministry now 46 years. Pastor of this church almost 18 and a half years, 18 and a quarter years. I've got a lot of experience under my belt in ministry. But I'm going to stand here and tell you today that I can't go a day without prayer. I'm going to stand here and tell you today that I don't care who you are. I don't care how many gifts you've got in operation. I don't care how long you've been around here or around any apostolic church. I don't care how long your hair is, how short your hair is. If you're a man, I don't care if you got on a dress, if you're a lady. All that's important. But if you don't pray, none of the rest of it's going to save you. Hello? I practice prayer. Number four, my fourth note tonight. Given the evil work in our day, I'm going to tell you we can't make it without prayer. I told you last Wednesday night that every major institution of our society is against the church. Now you can think I'm a conspiratist if you want, but think if you will about the news you've heard, watched, and read just in the last seven days. Think about what Hollywood is saying about righteousness and godliness and morality. Think about how the Supreme Court is voting on righteousness, uh, on morality. Think about what educators are teaching our children and young people about morality and godliness in the scripture. Think about, if you will, how that every element, every function of society has turned its back on what's right and what is godly. I'm telling you that if you're not a man or woman of prayer, you're not going to make it in this day. I can't tell you how many of you have said to me, Pastor, I feel so helpless. Pastor, all of this is going on. I don't know how to respond. Could you be honest? How many have had those kind of thoughts? Wave your hand. Look at you. Almost everybody in here. You know what? Zig Ziglar said one time, or no, it was uh, uh, the, the, the marriage guy, the counselor, uh, Dobson. Dobson said he asked 100 couples if they ever fight. He said 99 said yes, and the other one's a liar. Hello? I'm telling you. We're dealing with things today that will make you think, I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to say. I'm afraid if I say anything, I'll be cut off. I'll be be ostracized. I'll lose my job. I'll get reprimanded. It'll go in my record. I can't say what I believe. I can't. Now, people that believe wrong, they can talk all they want. Hello? Hello? It's just people that believe the Bible can't talk all they want. People that believe in what's right can't talk all they want. We're living in a day when you don't know what to do, which way to turn, how to respond. Can I tell you that prayer is always in order? Can I tell somebody here tonight that prayer can do what you can't do anyway? Can I tell you tonight that if we would all pray and again, just talk to God about it. God, my boss said this. The job's saying that. They're putting a lot of pressure on me. God, I need your help. I need you to protect my job, protect my home, protect my income, protect my family. And I want you to know that when you pray prayers like that, our God hears your prayer and God can answer those kind of prayers. Clap your hands, everybody, and say, I believe it. Given the evil at work in our day, we can't make it without prayer. Number five in my notes, if we try to make it without prayer, listen carefully, you are cheating yourself. You're overlooking a very real source of personal power and strength when you try to do it on your own, when you try to do it without prayer, when you try to figure it out in your own wisdom, when you try to flex your muscles and say what you're going to do and not do. 
There's a lot of things going on in our world right now, friend, that there is no flesh answer for it. There's a lot of things going on in our world that in the flesh you aren't tough enough to battle. You aren't tough enough to change it. You're not tough enough to fix it. But I'm going to tell you without stuttering or stammering that if we would all start praying, if we would all start taking it to God, if we would communicate with Him on a regular basis, I just don't know if it's right talking to God when I'm driving my car. Do you talk to your wife when you're driving your car? you talk to your husband when you're driving your car? Hello? I just don't know if it's right that I talk to God while I'm washing dishes. How about your kids? you talk to them while you're washing dishes? I'm going to be really carnal. One of my favorite places to pray is in the shower. Don't you waste time anywhere that you can spend it talking to Him and let Him talk to you. You all know how I feel about my grandbabies. I went out there in that horrible rain to help get them all inside. Ain't nothing I wouldn't do for my grandbabies. And when they run in my office, it don't matter if David Bernard's sitting in the office with me or I'm on the phone with him. When my grandbabies come in, they get my attention. I talk to them and they can't even talk back. Jax did something the other day, and his mama said, Jax, you can't do that. I wish you'd have seen that little one-year-old that screwed up and said, I'm sorry. I didn't even know he could say anything like that. I hang on every word, everything they say. I wonder what would happen if we all felt that way about God. That when I feel the presence of God, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to talk to Him and listen to Him a little bit. I'm going to make time for Him no matter how busy or who I'm with or who's around. I'm going to make time for God. I'm here to tell you that if we would take that that view of prayer, if we would create that uh, habit in our life of prayer, it is amazing what God would do. And if you're not doing it, if you're not talking to Him every time you get a chance, if you're not talking to Him as you go along the way, things you're doing that basically would be a waste of time, I had a pastor friend the other day told me, I quit watching the news. I said, I quit that months ago. I deleted NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, CNN, Fox. I deleted them all off of my phone and my iPads and computer. Now if I watch anything at all, it's because somebody tells me and I got to go look for it on YouTube or something. But I don't watch it every day like I used to. I don't, I don't have all of those things on my phone. And when my friend told me he quit, I said, what are you doing with all the time you spent watching that? He said, I'm talking to the Lord now. Can I tell you that if you'll spend whatever time you're doing something that you know you really don't need in your life, not that it's wrong, I ju- it's just not as important as talking to God. It is amazing how it would change your life. I love to hunt. I love to deer hunt. Getting ready to go bear hunting. I love to hunt. But I'm telling you, I can't. There, there is no way. Where if Cecil was in here or Bob, they're both not here tonight. Uh, Bob's on vacation. Cecil's over at the kids. But if they were here tonight, they'd tell you. It's amazing how many sermons pastors written sitting in a deer stand. I'm gonna tell you. Until the deer come around, there ain't nothing to do. You might as well talk to God. There's just a lot of things we do that keep us from spending good time with God. Number six in my notes. My family, whether they know it or not, relies on and benefits from my prayers. It's important for me as the head of our family to cover my family in prayer. Now I know I just bragged on you men like Never before in my life, just two or three days ago. And I'm not sorry I did. But I'm telling you, Dad, it isn't your wife's job to pray over your family as the head of the house. Amen. 
Every man, you say, oh, I'm just not like that. I can't pray like Brother Crouch does or Brother Kelsey Wilkins or Brother Forrest Powers. Now, there's a praying machine right there. I can't walk around here and pray like, you don't have to. You can pray sitting in your car. God, put a hedge around my house. Put a hedge around my marriage. Put a hedge around my children. God, put a hedge around their minds. You say, you mean I can say it just like that? I promise you God knows what you're saying. And that's real prayer, folks. When we present our needs to him, that's really prayer. Clap your hands if you just got an inkling of what I'm saying. My family needs me to pray over them as the head of the house. My wife is a tremendous prayer warrior. She prays over our family. Our family needs us to hold them up in prayer and cover them in prayer. And your family needs you to cover them in prayer. Can you say amen? So let's go a little bit deeper with this. Number seven in my notes. The staff and ministry of Bible World Church. Whether they know it or not, they rely on and benefit from my prayers. You believe the scripture that says the anointing started at the prophet's head and ran all the way down to the sandals of his shoes on the floor? That's the way anointing works, folks. It starts here and it works its way down. And if up here isn't in tune with God, everything else is going to be out of tune with God. You know, the difference in me and a lot of preachers you listen to is that I actually back up everything I say with Scripture. Number eight, see if you're ready for this. This congregation, whether you know it or not, relies on and benefits from my prayers. I guarantee you, no joke, I get... If it's three or four, it's a slow day. People calling me with a major emergency. Sometimes it's eight or 10 or 15 a day. We got people right now, two or three, that are in the hospital right while I'm standing here, taken to the emergency room. We got families that have had major traumatic things happen yesterday, last night, middle of the night and today. And they're on the phone with me and we're praying together. I'm telling you that you better thank God you got a pastor that believes in prayer. I know it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn, but you'll understand why I'm saying these things in a minute. I've already told dad, you've got to be the prayer warrior, the head, the prayer cover of your family. You can't delegate to mom. You can't delegate to a good spiritual teenager. Dad, you are not off the hook. It is your job to be the prayer cover of your family. Now your wife may be one of those weeping, crying, walking, talking, beat the altar, powerful, passionate prayer warriors. I'm not telling you, Dad, you got to do that. Some of you men aren't that emotional, but the good news is God didn't say be emotional with me. God said talk to me. Talk to me. And I'm telling every pastor in this church and every leader in this church that if you want to help me, quit asking me for pulpit time and start finding you a place to pray. This is going to go over like a lead balloon, but we got too many men and women that have a burden for the pulpit. They don't have a burden for an altar. They don't have a burden for the lost. They don't have a burden for prayer. When am I going to get in the pulpit? When am I going to get to say something? When are you going to put me on the... I shouldn't even tell you this, but Rick knows it's true. Every time somebody asks me, when's it going to be my turn to preach? I literally go in my phone and mark out six months, do not use so-and-so. Some of them ain't going to be used till they're like 90 years old, they ask so often. 
I'm not looking for people who's got a burden for the pulpit. If you're a pastor in this church, a leader in this church, a department head in this church, an example in this church, a licensed minister in this church, this church needs your prayer cover. This church needs you to be the man or woman of God that we've recognized the possibility of in you. Say amen, somebody. I've asked... I, I did it in the last week. We've had young man, men with us on trips, young men that have gone with Bobby and, and, and Ricardo and me and Cecil and all this back and forth to the camps we've had to do, getting the camps ready for our youth camps to start next Sunday. We've, we've just had several young men. And I don't know if these other guys have figured it out. They'll know it if they listen to this. But I always ask those young men to pray. Every time we sit down for a meal, I'll say, I'll say, Charlie Brown, I want you to pray. I'll say to Cecil's son that was with us, Jordan, I want you to pray. I'll say to whoever, whatever young man's with us, the little, what's his name, Joshua. I said, Joshua, I want you to pray when you're with us, when we're sitting down to eat. What are you doing that for, Brother Cunningham? Because I want them to learn how to pray a long time before they learn how to do anything else. I want them to have a relationship with God. I want them to know how to talk to God. I want them to not be afraid to talk to God. Asher's only three years old, before in a couple weeks, and we already have him pray for meals. Amaris have been praying for meals for years. I want them to know how to talk to God. Now, having said that, and this is the part I maybe shouldn't say, when I ask a 14, 15, 16-year-old boy or girl that's with us to pray, let me tell you what I'm looking for. I'm trying to figure out if they've got a touch of God on their life. I'm observing to see if they're comfortable talking to the Lord. I'm observing, do they feel God when they talk to God? Is there something changes in their voice while they're talking to God? Because when I see that in prayer, it shows me here's one that God's going to use prayer I want every leader of this church to cover your department cover your ministry with prayer I know we read a lot of leadership books we have a lot of ministry training we go to a lot of events but let me declare to you tonight there is nothing more important in leadership than you knowing how to pray can you say amen? amen? Everybody said amen. amen. Number nine on my list is that prayer is an essential habit for all believers. Prayer is an essential habit for all believers. That starts with me. It starts with you that are leaders, you that are ministers, you that are department heads. We've got to set the example of prayer and cover, cover those around us in prayer. Amen? I read a little statement that said seven days without prayer makes one week. Only week was spelled W-E-A-K. Seven days without prayer makes one week. And I promise you, if it's been seven days since you've prayed, you ought to get up and walk out of here as soon as we're done and go find you a, yourself a place to pray, to talk to the Lord. Amen? Amen? Number 10 in my notes. I'm hoping to get done with this tonight. Number 10. Now, I'm going to slow down here. I deliberately don't brag about or talk much about my personal prayer life. I don't, I don't brag about who I prayed for and who I didn't. What I said and what I didn't. My words, as if, as if my words did the miracle. I know it would surprise you how many people want me to know. Oh, pastor, I had my hands on him when he got the Holy Ghost. Really? You think that made a difference or what? What are you trying to tell me? Oh, pastor, did you hear John Doe got healed? I prayed for him three or four days ago. What are you trying to tell me? We're supposed to pray, but we're not supposed to brag about it. 
we're surely not supposed to shame other people about it. I'm going to blow your mind today. You ain't going, some of you ain't going to like it at all. But I'd rather everybody in this room pray 10 minutes a day, real prayer, than just go through the motions, say a bunch of words that don't matter. I was in a prayer meeting. My wife knows exactly what I'm talking about. I was in a prayer meeting, and there's this old boy over in the corner. He thinks he's God's gift to the church. And he's over in the corner. We're having an hour prayer meeting with ministers. And here's what he's doing. He's over in the corner going, Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. For an hour. And I'm thinking God's in heaven saying, Shut up. Stop. That ain't prayer, folks. I'd rather you spend 10 minutes a day talking to God. First of all, if you'll spend 10 minutes a day talking to Him, for long it's going to be 20, 30, 40, 50, when you see the benefit and the power and the strength that comes from really talking to God and having God talk to you. Amen? Don't deliberately brag about or talk much about your prayer life. That's between you and God. How many of you men go around telling everybody else? How, how many of you coming in here even tonight? As soon as you got in the lobby, you start saying, hey, guess what? Me and the wife had a talk today. You know, we just kind of stopped everything for about five minutes. We just talked to each other. You don't do that. People think you're stupid. I can't say that word. Forgive me, God, Jesus. Wouldn't it be absolutely crazy? Come in, sit down on the road and say, Hey, Tim, good to see you. You know what? Me and the old lady talked today a little bit. You'd look at your wife and say, What in the world's wrong with him? But it's amazing how many of us want everybody to know we talk to God. Don't brag about talking to God. Talk to God. My opinion is every time somebody comes and says to me, Pastor, I want you to know I prayed an hour today. I say, great, and walk away thinking. It's probably the first time they've prayed in six months. Because they want me to know it. They want me to know they prayed an hour today. Who, Jesus. You know, it's a good thing the camera's on me that there's not another camera up here scanning y'all. Because your faces would tell a story. The Bible says, are you okay? We're going to go back to the Bible. That's my way of doing it. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 5. Everybody say, Jesus said. Jesus. Everybody accept that as a good authority. Amen? Amen? Jesus said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. He said, I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they're ever going to get. So when you tell somebody what a prayer warrior you are, boy, I hope they brag on you because that's all you're going to get out of it. And are you willing to trade God answering prayers for some saint just thinking you're cool because of how much you brag on praying? Because that's all the reward you're going to get. We need to get to the place where we talk to God and we have intimate communication with Him and Him with us. That's what real prayer is all about. Amen? Y'all still with me? Number 11 in my notes. When I talk to God, I talk just exactly like I would talk to you. Exactly. I don't have a King James voice. Oh Lord, thou art great. God of heaven, thou art. I don't pray like that. Sometimes I start out saying, hey God, this is me again and I'm a knucklehead. 
You talked to me and I didn't get it and I know I didn't get it, so here we go again, God. I talked to him just like that. God, this is me and I need you to touch my family. I pray around my grandbabies, my grandboys and granddaughter. I'm telling you, I pray a hedge over them. I talk to God about putting a hedge around them and protecting them in this evil world and I talk just like I'm talking right now. We bought that bus yesterday. Rick can tell you. I met with the whole staff and I said, if God wants us to have a bus, he'll give us a bus. And I started praying, God, you know what we need. You know the kind of bus we need. You know the price we can afford to pay. You know, God, we need a bus that's going to run good, that's going to be safe for our kids. I talked to him about that kind of stuff. You say, oh, Brother Cam, I didn't know you'd pray about a bus. I pray about pretty much everything. I talk to him just like I'm talking to you. And sometimes my conversation with him, I'm frustrated with myself. I don't try to hide that from him. Sometimes I'm fearful of something. I don't try to hide that from God. Just talk to him like you do everybody else. What are you doing tonight, Brother Cunningham? You're destroying this whole prayer theology that, 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 that's part of the apostolic movement of showing up here before daylight and praying two or three hours, beating the altars and screaming and hollering and hollering amen and hallelujah 49 times. It ain't prayer. I'm sorry, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, it is not prayer. Prayer. Prayer is when you talk to God. The Bible said he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The Bible said that when we approach him, we ought to approach him. What's the Bible say? Abba, Father. Do you know the definition of Abba, Father? I dare you to look it up tonight. The best English definition for Abba, Father is Daddy. Daddy. And he says, that's how I want you to talk to me. I want you to talk to me like I'm your daddy. I want you to jump up on my lap. I want you to tell me what's wrong. Tell me where it hurts. Tell me what I can fix. Tell me what I can do for you. I want you to approach me as Abba Father. If you understand that, shout yes. yes. Number 12 in my notes. I never, ever pray just to put in time. Never. I know they say you never say never. But on this one point, I'm going to say never. I never pray just to put in time. I don't do it. There's times I'm sitting in my office. And I feel like, you know what? I need to talk to the Lord. I need to get aside. I need to get away. All the staff's working. I need to get away by myself. And I'll slip out the back door of my office and slip over here. And I'll decide I'm going to walk. That's what I generally do is walk and pray. And I decide I'm going to start walking and praying. Just walk around here and pray. There are times I go through that door. And before I get back to that corner in that aisle way, God says to me, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take care of it all done don't fear I'm I'm working it out do you know what I don't do I don't walk around this room another hour asking him to do what he already said he would do now there's other times my wife knows that when we were in our 20s and thought we were losing the whole kit and caboodle the whole church and Everything that could go wrong had gone wrong. Looked like everything's going to be shut off. Everything's going to be lost in that little home missions church. I told her Tuesday night. I said, babe, I'm going into church and pray. I'm not coming out till I hear from God. And as if this was going to happen. I said, I don't care if the president of the United States calls. Don't you interrupt me. I come out there, I prayed all night. I laid down in the middle of the platform in an empty church and laid there and prayed. I walked and prayed. I sat in the seats and prayed. I was still there Wednesday evening when Bible study time came. I walked out of the sanctuary, shaved my face, washed my face, combed my hair, changed my clothes, and went back in and taught a Bible study. I thought everything was lost. 
After church, the church secretary comes up the aisle white as a sheet. He said, hey, pastor, you know that visitor lady that was here tonight? This is the Wednesday night. I just quit praying before church. He said, she put $3,000 in the offering tonight. Now, honey, that was a whole lot of money 40 years ago. It paid every bill we had in the world, kept everything turned on. Thank God, paid everything it needed paid. That same woman came back to church on Sunday. I don't remember, Elsie, wasn't it 18 or 19 or visitors she had? It was a bunch. Do you remember? How many? 21, she said. She came back Sunday, the whole slew of visitors. More than half of them got the Holy Ghost and got baptized. Before we were done, that one woman was responsible for about 30 people getting baptized and getting the Holy Ghost and coming and being a part of the church and paying tithes and offerings. You say, Brother Cunningham, you believe in praying 24 hours? I believe in praying till you hear from God. I believe in praying till you touch God. Say, oh, I believe the Bible said pray an hour a day. It does not. There's one place where Jesus said to his disciples who were laying down asleep, couldn't you last it one hour? And some goofball somewhere said, see there, Jesus said, you've got to pray an hour a day. That ain't what he said at all. He was rebuking them for not even staying awake one single hour when he was praying all night long. Ooh, Jesus. Oh, I wish you could see your faces right now. We've been taught since I was two years old. Our day, our day. Bible says an hour a day. It does not. Let me tell you what the Bible teaches. You pray till you hear from God. You pray till you touch God. Look at the examples of the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament that they prayed until they heard from God. They got a word from God. And honey, all you need is a word from God because everything in this universe is a product of a word from God. He said, let there be light. And there was a sun and a moon. He said, let there be water and air and trees and grass and mountains and rivers and valleys. Everything you know started as a word from God. It's all you need. It's all you need. And so when I start down that way and God said, I got it. It's taken care of. It's all I need. I don't want to pray three hours. Now there's other times it seems like I can't get him to answer. And so I go on and on and on for days and days and days praying about the same thing. But the bottom line is, pray till you get an answer from God. And it's not my message, but let me interject this. Sometimes God's answer is no. And it's just as much an answer from God as yes. <laughs> pray till you hear from God. Don't pray watching your watch. Don't pray looking at your watch. Say, oh, you know, I, I get up every morning, six, pray from six to seven. I pray every morning, four to five. I pray every morning, five to six. I'm not telling you to stop that. If you enjoy that time with the Lord and it's productive, please, please, please go on and do it. Please keep it up. I'm, don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you to stop it. But if your view of praying an hour is like this, Oh, God, oh, God, yeah, Lord, yeah, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, my God, I got 13 more minutes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That ain't praying. Again, I keep using husband-wife analogies. How about you're sitting at the kitchen table talking to your wife, and you pull your thing up and said, uh, hurry up, Heather, and get done talking. I've only got three more minutes for you. Ben's going to show up with a black eye. Don't treat God that way. I'd rather if you're going to, you can tell someone, I'm going to pray an hour, and at the end of 20 minutes, you've told him everything you know to say, and now you're in that hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, just go home. Get you some rest. Go to, if it's 6 in the morning, go to Waffle House. I 
I'd ask how many of you think I'm crazy, but there's people that would raise their hand. <laughs> Better that I don't know. <laughs> Folks, it's just got to be real. Everybody say real. real. It's got to be real. This isn't fake. This isn't something we're doing just going through the motions. And in the day that we live in, somebody needs to hear me. This is for all the marbles. The day we're living in is going to see the coming of the Lord. I will be the most surprised man on this earth if God don't come in my lifetime. And I'm already 65 years old. I'm telling you Jesus is coming. I'm telling you things are wrapping up. I'm telling you the world's getting more evil and the devil's getting more aggressive. And you better make your mind up that relationship with God is real. 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 Say amen, somebody. Come on, say amen. amen. The Bible said in Matthew 6, verse 7. Go back to the scripture again. But when you pray, you ready? This one verse is going to change some folks' prayer life. What you say when you pray. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do. That's what the book says. For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Hmm? How many of you want to pray according to the scripture? How many of you want your prayers to be effective? How many of you realize that it is absolutely essential that all believers have a prayer life? In Jesus' name. Number 13 in my notes. Anybody know what time it is? I left my watch at the camp two weeks ago. What is it? 7.58. Thank you, David. Number 13 in my notes. I sometimes pray an hour at one time. I have on occasion prayed all night. You got to get this point if you miss everything I'm saying. But mainly, I pray many times a day. I don't even know how long it would be. It really depends on the phone calls I'm making, the responsibilities I've got, things I need to talk to God about, things I need to tell God I need His help with. It just kind of depends on how many of those there are. How many of you have ever written to me and said, Brother Cunningham, I've got a prayer request and almost immediately you got an answer back that said, I'm praying right now. How many of you? That's where I pray. I was up till 3 o'clock two nights ago because of one of our families that were in such a dire situation. And it wasn't just me. I had the youth leaders up, Sunday school teachers up. I had saints up and we were praying. We were praying. I can tell you that we pray many, many times a day. When Edna called me today and said she was heading to the emergency room with Dale, we sat there and started praying right there and started praying in the Holy Ghost right at that moment. I'm telling you, those of you that when someone says, I'm in a mess right now, I need prayer, and the best answer you can come up with is I'll put you on my prayer list and tomorrow morning when I pray, I'll pray for you. But from now till then, you're basically saying just suffer through it. Hello? I, I have prayed an hour. I go to minister's prayer meetings in the district where they have an hour of prayer. I've come out here and prayed an hour. There's situations that have driven me to prayer for a period of time and situations where I've prayed late into the night or got up early because the situation was that dire. But on a normal day, and that's what I'm trying to talk to you about tonight, is what is a normal prayer life. I talk to God all day long, a minute here, a minute and a half there, 15 minutes over here. I pray for God as need to God as needs arrive. And guess what I found out? It's effective. Because many times I get that prayer request, we go to prayer, and 30 minutes later they call back and say, guess what? They're dismissing my husband. He's going home from the hospital. What if we'd have waited to pray about that tomorrow? Hello? Come on, somebody. 
Who was that guy we prayed for? One of the Guamanians that we just prayed for. Brother Ed, are you here, Ed? Tell me, Force, help me to make sure I'm not wrong here. But the call that we got was Ed fell, hit his head, split his head, bleeding profusely. He was unconscious. He broke his skull. They, they said he's in really, really bad shape. They took him to one hospital. That hospital looked at his head and said, we can't do nothing. They put him in an ambulance and took him to Norfolk General. Is that correct? And we all were praying. They called and said, we need prayer right now. Ed's not responding. Ed hit his head. Ed's bleeding profusely. He's broken his skull. He's in trouble. He's unconscious. They can't wake him up. Is all of that part of what we heard? And so in the ambulance to Norfolk General, we got everybody praying how, how much time lapsed till we got a call back a couple hours later Norfolk General when he got there didn't even know why he was being transferred because when they brought him into the ER he woke up they put a few stitches in his head and there was no skull fracture. This is what the EMTs, Brother Kelsey, and the emergency room of another hospital said, but now all of a sudden Ed's okay and never spent one day in the hospital. They just sent him home. You say, oh, that's a coincidence. You believe what you want to believe, but I believe that it's important that when you're faced with a need, go to prayer. Go to prayer. Somebody shout amen. amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Listen to this third section of this verse. Continuing instant in prayer. Continuing instant instant in prayer I'd rather you'd get your hour a day in praying 32 minute prayers and praying for 30 specific things somebody on your job says you know what my marriage is in a mess I know you're a praying man I wish you would pray. You ought to surprise of God I need you to help Joe right now and his wife I need you to put a hedge around him you don't got to pray 30 minutes. You don't got to walk around, beat the walls, and start screaming and hollering. Just drop your head and sincerely talk to God. It would amaze you how many of those kind of prayers God answers. Now, I'm not telling you that when you're in a mess, you may want to come beat the altar, and I'll beat the altar with you. But listen to me every single day. Don't just pray emergent. Don't just pray emergency to emergency, and pray like the world's coming to an end. Then you don't pray again for thirty more days to the next emergency. That's not communication. Every day, talk to God. My wife called me today. I don't even remember. What, I'm sorry, Elsie. I don't even remember what she called about. But two or three times a day, she called me in the office. Hey, Jack. We go. Oh, I know. Ha <laughs> ha. Shouldn't say it. <laughs> Just remembered. She wanted to know about going to a spa day. She told me she had a gift certificate. I said, go. God bless you. Have a good time. And then we hung the phone up. We've had eight or ten of those conversations today. Guess what that is? That's called normal marriage. You know what a normal relationship with God is? You talk to him several times a day and let him talk to you several times a day. That's normal relationship. We are wrong in the church for teaching people that if you don't get up and pray an hour and then leave them with the impression that when they've done that, they've done all they require God, the other 23 belongs to them. And you don't got to worry about it again till tomorrow morning in that hour. That is not relationship. That's not prayer. Now, am I against morning prayer? Not on your life. We got a bunch of them going on around here. And I don't want one of you to quit because of what I'm teaching. It's okay for you to pray, but don't go the next 23 hours with thinking I've done all I got to do. I don't have to do no more. Amen? 
Let's read on what the scripture says. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 18. Praying what? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. How do you pray quit your job? Don't ever do no housework? Don't mow the grass? I do, I'm a man of prayer. I got I to gotta be in prayer without ceasing all the time. You know what it means? It means every time some need comes up, you're going to pray right then. Right then. Rick got a situation we need to pray about. Let's pray right now, Brother Rick. Let's pray. How many times in our office do we do this where we just stop everything we're doing because someone's called in and said we need prayer? We don't put it on tomorrow's prayer list. We pray without ceasing. Do you understand what the Scripture's trying to tell us here? You ought to be a person of prayer 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Now, I don't expect everybody to do this, but I sleep with my phone literally on the nightstand beside my head. And I don't turn it off at night. You know why? Because we don't have hours. Pastors don't have hours. You can't have that heart attack at 3 in the morning. I don't come on till 8. Hello? I can't, my wife knows, my daughter knows how many scores of times I've got up from a hot meal and walked off and prayed and completely missed a meal with the family because the emergency came at mealtime. You've got to be the kind of person that if you believe in prayer, when somebody needs prayer, and sometimes a minute or two is okay, but you literally have the kind of relationship with God that you can say, God, David needs you right now. God, help David right now. Strengthen David right now. Heal David's body. And sometimes that's all you've got to do. You've made contact with God because you've got that kind of relationship with God. Am I making any sense or is this a bunch of foolishness? <laughs> Number 14. I'm almost done. I set four alarms on my phone to remind me to pray four prayers every day. It doesn't matter how many other needs come up in the day. These four alarms went off this morning. They go off every morning. That's a screenshot on my phone that I put up there. 9 a.m., an a, a alarm goes off, and I've got the most horrible sounding alarm you ever heard in your life. There's nothing worth. It's absolutely just a, offensive. But at 9 o'clock, I pray, even so, come Lord Jesus. And I pray it every day. At 9.10, if I'm still praying the first one, that alarm goes off again. And I speak peace over Bible World Church every day of the world. God, I speak peace over this church. I speak peace over every marriage. I speak peace, oh God, over every family. I speak peace over your people every single day. Day. Third prayer I pray every day is, God, I want you to get glory out of my life. And some days when I'm thinking I'm not what I ought to be, and yet preachers feel that same as you do, there's times I'll start out by saying, God, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I want you to some way get glory out of my life. That's how real I am with God. I don't try to fake. Does anybody here think you can actually fake God out? God, get glory out of my life. I want you to some way, somehow, get glory out of my life. And the last prayer I pray every day is a declaration of my faith. And we've done it a thousand times in here. God is good. I am blessed. He shall supply all my need. It's a declaration of my faith in God. I don't know what you're, what you're praying every day. I don't know what your, 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 the things are that you're asking God continually to do but you may want to do something like that just every day remind yourself I need to talk to God every day I want to tell him every day come today Lord Jesus it's oh you say oh brother whoa ho ho 
We're going somewhere on vacation this year. We've been planning on for years. And so you want Jesus to wait till right after vacation before he comes. Oh, we just bought a new car, new house, just moved in. So you're, you're wanting him to wait till the water tank burst. Every day of our lives, children of God ought to be saying, Lord, come today. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I don't know what you're passionate about, but I'm asking you, get passionate about something and then pray it every day you live. There ought to be prayers in there about your children and your grandchildren. If you've got children at home, there ought to be prayers you pray every day about your marriage, about your finances, about God's protection, about Him putting a hedge around you. There's too many people that are just thinking they're lucky and that my luck is somehow going to hold out. We need to pray. We need to be people of prayer. Can you say amen? amen. Everybody said amen. Stand with me and I'll close. Uh-oh. I told you I had 15 things. I got 16. And 16 is two pages long. It ain't going to happen. Y'all going to have to believe I only believe 15 things about prayer. <laughs> Number 15. Anybody that knows me, anybody that knows me, knows that I don't hold grudges. I can forget offenses. I can forget mistakes. I can forget mess ups like nobody you ever met in your lifetime. People will come up to me and say, oh, preacher, you know what I did? No, I really can't remember what you did. But preacher, you know this thing that, no, I don't remember. I don't know how I do it. I honestly don't know. It's just the goodness of God. I can remember, I can remember dates. You know, I, I tease Brother Blankenship all the time. He's the district secretary. He makes minutes. He writes minutes for all of our board meetings. But when we get home from board meetings, he calls me. And he says, I'm trying to finish up the minutes. What did Joe say? What did Bill say? What did Tom say? And I can remember what they said, why they said it, what their vote was. But you let somebody do something bad to me, I can't remember it for nothing. And I don't want none of y'all reminding me. Hello? Why would you be of that opinion, Brother Cunningham? Here it is. And it's the last thing you'll be hearing from me tonight about prayer. Is that if you have unforgiveness in your heart. Because somebody did you wrong. The Bible said God is not going to hear your prayer. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. That's what God said. God said, you have unforgiveness in your heart. I'm not going to hear your prayer. And I promise you what he don't hear, he don't answer. Hello? The last important thing I can tell you about prayer is that if there's anything in your heart when you go to prayer, the Bible said in Mark 11, 25 and 26, and when you stand praying, what's it say? Forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. The reason salvation begins with repentance is that there's no way God can save you. If you haven't said you're sorry for the things you've done wrong. And guess what? There's a lot of people not healed because they don't repent. There's a lot of people not walking in victory because they don't repent. There's a lot of people that are not getting their prayers through because they don't repent. The Bible said their prayers are actually hindered. Everybody say hindered. hindered. That's a Bible word. Their prayers are hindered. Who's doing the hindering? God himself. God hinders your prayers from getting through. Because you have an unrepentant spirit. Because you haven't forgiven. 
And I want to tell us that if it matters to you whether or not your prayers get through, if it matters to you whether or not God answers, whether or not God heals, whether or not God forgives, whether or not you have the victory, if any and all of that matters to you, then you've got to be a forgiving person. I don't care how spiritual you think you are. It matters not how long you've been around here. It don't matter how much of the holiness standards you've applied to your life. If you've got unforgiveness in your heart, if you've got hatred in your heart, the Bible said God's not going to hear you. Hello? And I'm telling you, I'm telling you that every day, part of those real prayers we have with God needs to be, God, I'm sorry. God, I, I, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't be thinking that. I shouldn't be holding on to that. I should let it go. I'm going to stop right there. Why don't you lift your hands and ask God to help all of us. I want you to know that prayer is not supposed to be hard. It's not supposed to be difficult. It's not hard, supposed to be hard to understand or hard to participate in. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Brother Troy, come on, let's all pray. Father, we need your help tonight. God, we want to be pleasing to you. We want to have a right and a real relationship with you. God, we want to be able to talk to you like we do Abba, Father, our Daddy. God, we want to be able to present our needs to you, our desires to you, our wants to you, our fears to you, that which we lack to you. God, we want to be able to tell you anything. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you feel that I have tore up your prayer life tonight, why don't you try adding what I've said without stopping what you've been doing? I ain't going to hurt you to pray too much. It will hurt you to pray not enough. So add what I'm telling you. Don't stop what you've been doing and go home sane. 